All right, here we go. We are here for this video responding to popular theistic evolutionist William Lane, Lane Craig. And I want to get right into it as this is going to be a series of response videos, specifically to his video titled, Is Evolution a Theory? And I'm going to, I just want to make sure I've got the audio clicked because I want to allow him to convey his first point, or at least the point we're going to respond to uh, here today. It does have a lot to do with the uh, separate ancestry model versus the universal common ancestry model. William Lane Craig is basically a uh, theistic evolutionist, somebody who believes in universal common ancestry, the model that says all life, including whales, pine trees, and humans are related. Now, I've given many presentations on this, on this topic. And so I guess briefly, here's an example of the universal tree of life that somebody like William Lane Craig, a theistic evolutionist, would hold to. And so here you've got the common ancestor right at the base and everything descending from that common ancestor, basically. Humans, chimpanzees, whales, grasses, banana plants. And so everything related to a common ancestor, as you can see here, uh, lions, bears, humans, bacteria. All related to a common ancestor. Here's a more sophisticated phylogenetic tree, but it basically says the same thing. The model that uh, creationists hold to and the model that the Bible teaches or conveys is the separate ancestry model, which suggests that not all life exists or common ancestry, that there exists independent ancestries or separate ancest ancestries. And so right here, a very basic phylogeny. You've got humans disconnected from any other form of life. The evolutionary says that the chimpanzee or the great apes are our closest living relatives. And so they'll argue that humans and chimpanzees go back to a common ancestor. The uh, separate ancestry model, the biblical creation model of ancestry would suggest that humans are not related to uh, chimpanzees or the great apes in general. And there's a number of lines of evidence that demonstrate that. I've given numerous presentations and we'll go over a few in this uh, series responding to William Lane Craig. Now in his uh, video here, he is basically responding to an article put out by Dr. Jason Lyle. And his responses are two points that Dr. Jason Lyle goes over in, in his article dealing with whether or not evolution is a theory or if it should be called a theory. So let's uh, play the first clip here. It's true, but to say that it's not a theory, I think is just a fantasy. Up next in the article, he says, is neo-Darwinian evolution a theory? Is the idea of particles to people evolution a theory in this primary sense? Evolutionists often list three kinds of evidence that they believe supports evolution. First, organisms have certain similarities and differences in their anatomy. These similarities can be arranged into a hierarchy, uh, which is what makes taxonomy possible. The phylum, the class, order, family, genus, species. Furthermore, the DNA of two different organisms tends to be similar if those organisms are anatomically similar. So let's pick these one at a time, Bill, beginning with oh, that one. Okay. First of all, in laying out three evidences for common descent, which is what he's talking about here, uh, he really doesn't survey the, most of the evidence. This is another evolutionary textbook, uh, Evolution by Fatima and Kirkpatrick. And in this volume, they lay out seven different lines of independent evidence in support. Now, I just want to point out uh, before we get into the meat of this video, uh, firstly, I'm starting at roughly the 10 minute mark because I want to get into the actual evidence discussed. And so this is essentially our first point in the video where we're going to discuss some uh, so-called evidence for evolution, specifically homology. Later on in the video, we get into junk DNA pseudogenes. That part will be for a separate video. This one will basically be dealing with homology. But I want to point out that whether it's three lines of evidence, seven lines of evidence, or 70 lines of evidence, okay, it's all 
easily debunked. It's all easily countered. Most of it is agnostic anyways to the overall debate as in it's non-discriminatory, which means both models, creation and evolution can explain the data. So there's nothing special here, whether it's in your more technical arguments, endogenous retroviruses. I've written an entire book on endogenous retroviruses, whether it's uh, chromosome two fusion, whether it's nested hierarchies in anatomy or genetics. Okay, pseudogenes and the fact that some of these pseudogenes fall out in the nested hierarchical patterns. We can look to all of the icons of evolution, all of the so-called transitional forms, and we can look to the arguments again from junk DNA, ALU sequences. Okay, it's all we have answers to all of those arguments. So again, whether it's three which it sounds like in Dr. Jason Lyle's argument, he's focusing primarily on three. Um, but we could look at seven. Again, we could look at 10. And they are all arguments that we can address and have sufficiently addressed. I've addressed these books in plenty of videos, in um, these arguments in my books, articles, and so on. So here we go. ...port of the thesis of common ancestry. And so he's dealing only with three of these, not even most of the evidence that is adduced on behalf of it. Now, the first piece of evidence that he deals with is the similarities in anatomy and in their um, genetic makeup. So let's talk about those a little bit. These are called uh, homologs. That is to say, you have uh, similar structures or similar genetic sequences of DNA in different organisms, which suggests that those organisms are uh, descended from a common ancestor. A good example of the structural homologs would be the so-called pentadactyl limb. That is to say, the limb of uh, tetrapods, four-limbed animals, that terminates in a five-fingered hand. And this skeletal structure is common in uh, humans, in seals with flippers, uh, in uh, lizards and uh, mammals of various sorts, uh, bats um, uh, even. So this, this pentadactyl limb is consistent across So first thing I want to say real quick is homologous pattern, these homologs that he talks about, shared structures in the biological world, they are agnostic to the overall creation versus evolution debate or the universal versus separate ancestry uh, debate. Human engineers build in homologous patterns. And so why shouldn't God? It's as simple as that. Okay. Re reusing amazing de designs, designs that work, designs that are there for functional purposes is, is good design. That's the way engineers do it. That's the way uh, computer coders do it. And so I just wanted to point that out real quick before we get into this topic in, in a little more detail. Across a wide variety of animals. And the suggestion is that this shows that they evolved from a common ancestor. Even more persuasive than the evidence of these morphological or structural homologs would be the genetic homologs. You have similar sequences in the DNA of diverse organisms that make them look like they're copies of each other. And it's thought that this is best explained by saying they inherited these DNA sequences from um, common ancestors. So those would be uh, one example of the evidence for common descent that he's talking about, these homologs of both morphology and genetics. Next, Dr. Lyle writes, quoting. Quickly, it would be the same thing on a genomic level as well. Just like uh, car manufacturers. Okay, take a car manufacturer like GM, take uh, Chrysler's, Ford, take Honda, Toyota, take car manufacturers on all con continents, on all kinds of continents, okay? Well, you're going to have similar designs in terms of the body of the vehicles okay all these vehicles are going to share engines a lot of them are going to have four tires what does that prove uh, a lot of them are going to share windshields the various cars from different manufacturers are going to be a certain height from the ground they're going to share safety features many will have navigation systems backup cameras all types of homologous features homologous patterns seen in man-made designs and that also goes for the blueprint and so your your blueprints to the vehicles whether it's an suv a van a hatchback or a sedan of all kinds of car manufacturers you're going to have similarities 
in the blueprint. As a matter of fact, your biggest differences will be seen in, in the end product. A lot of your similar stages in, in uh, your early stages in manufacturing, they're going to be extra similar to each other. But your again, your biggest dissimilarities or differences in vehicles will be the end product. And we oftentimes see that with biological organisms. If we were to look at embryological development, a lot of different uh, organisms have similarities in the early stages of embryological development, but then it's not until the um, later stages of embryological development that you see the largest uh, differences. And so let's continue here. The lines of evidence most often presented for evolution are perfectly consistent with biblical creation. Consider the fact that organisms can be uh, categorized into a taxonomic tree, but this doesn't imply common ancestry, end quote. Would you agree, Bill? I think that that is correct, that you can classify organisms without saying that they're genealogically related. When Carolus Linnaeus developed in the 18th century, the system of classifying animals as species, genus, uh, family, order, uh, and so forth, he did not imagine that these organisms belonging to the same classes were genealogically connected. So for example, he would put apes and humans in the same category, but he didn't imagine that they were genealogically related in that humans and apes descended from a common ancestor. So it is possible to do this kind of classification or taxonomy uh, without um, thinking that the organisms are genealogically related to each other. But the problem is if you hold that they are not genealogically related, then what explains those similarities that we've just talked about? What explains the relatedness of them if it isn't because they're derived from common ancestry? He says, well, it's perfectly consistent with a biblical creation. But the problem is, Kevin, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't define what biblical creation is. Um, it, it's a mystery what the theory of biblical creation. Okay, this is where I want to get into uh, some slides and visuals. So I don't know why he's so flabbergasted or baffled as to what the model of biblical creation is or says. At first, if you watch the, the video right from the beginning, it almost sounds like he's <clears throat> unfamiliar with who Dr. Jason Lyle is, which to me is flabbergasting because Dr. Jason Lyle is one of the leading speakers and voices in the world of young earth creation. You know, if you claim to be up to date on top young earth creationist arguments, including uh, testable predictions and models of ancestry. It's just kind of shocking that you wouldn't know who Dr. Jason Lyle is. Um, but what is biblical creation? Well, it, it's not a mystery. And so I briefly went over it earlier in terms of the separate ancestry model, but how we derive it from uh, scripture. And I want to go over a few visuals here for everybody, because the Bible claims to be the history book of the universe. And it's in the Bible where we read about the creation of man, where we read about, I just want to find a very specific slide here that'll go over various verses in Genesis that talk about how God created just two people with not a hint of evolutionary creation in there in terms of humans and chimpanzees being being related ultimately and so let's start from from this slide and so we would say that humans and chimpanzees and every other form of life are not connected that god would have created original kinds and from there you get your variations in the biological world. And so <clears throat> Genesis 2, 7 is clear. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Genesis 2, and the Lord caused, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, right? Adam, the first man. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Genesis 5, 2, male and female, he created them. We understand Jesus in the New Testament said, but from the beginning of the creation, referring back to the creation week, 
God made them male and female, referring to Adam and Eve. And so he defines the beginning of creation, that creation week, as also when uh, humans were created. And so the evolutionary model has billions of years until essentially, you know, humans are created. I think William Lane Craig would say the first humans were Homo heidelbergensis about 200,000 years ago. But you couldn't say that that's the beginning. That's for certain. Okay, Genesis 3. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. 1 Corinthians 15. And so it is written, uh, the first man, Adam. So again, we have two people, Adam and Eve, the first couple, the first human beings. This is clear. Do, do we see any hint at all in Genesis of humans coming about through evolutionary processes over time from pre-humans, Stralopithecine-like ancestors? Any hint that humans are related to bacteria, strawberries, apples, chimpanzees? No. The Bible claims to be the history book of the universe, and so the scientific data should be consistent with that. And as a matter of fact, it is. And I like to go over a, a couple quotes that talk about how uh, good science always affirms scripture. And that's a fact, empirical science. Now there's significant implications here. Okay, so firstly, by biblical creation, the biblical creation model, it's not a mystery. It's that God originally created Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve were the first humans and Adam and Eve were created separate from any other form of life. And so if we start with that uh, starting point, then we should find scientific evidence that confirms that. And as a matter of fact, that's what we do find. Okay. I mean, mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosome. I talk about this frequently. I've written on it extensively. Every single male Y chromosome on the planet is nearly identical and can be traced back to one single Y chromosomal ancestor just 4,500 years ago. We know that because the Y chromosome mutates incredibly fast. It's between one to three new mutations per person per generation. Okay. And in, in terms of uh, male inheritance. Remember, the Y chromosome is uniparentally inherited DNA. It's passed out on the father's side. We've also got uh, evidence for one female that we've all descended from. All mitochondrial DNA worldwide. Uh, mitochondrial DNA is that small piece of uh, DNA that is inherited on the mother's side. And that can all be traced to a single woman, not 200,000 years ago, not 100,000 years ago, but just thousands of years ago. Okay. And so the biblical Adam and Eve that we read about in Genesis are the sole ancestors of every single person who has ever lived. They don't go back further than that. They don't go back to pre-human ancestors. They're not related to chimpanzees and strawberries. Okay. And this comprises the sole genetic and genealogical ancestors. Now, the existence of our first parents, Adam and Eve, Adam, the first man, Eve, the mother of all living. Again, Jesus says from the beginning of creation, he made them male and female speaking to these people. Eve, the mother of all living and Adam, the first man. Our first parents have very important impl implications on the gospel message. If there was no first Adam, then what is the necessity of the last Adam? If Adam did not really exist, then why did Jesus die for the sins of the world? And so this is an authority issue in every single major Christian doctrine has its place or starting point in Genesis with the special creation of Adam and Eve, with the fall, with the first man who sinned, Adam, okay? The existence of a historical, a literal Adam and Eve is important theologically. We understand that what? Well, we understand that sin exists and we know we have death into the world. And the reason for death is because of sin. We are dead in Adam, but we can be alive in the last Adam, who is Jesus Christ. And we understand that salvation comes through Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We understand that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. So yes, salvation comes through Jesus Christ. And the necessity of salvation comes because of what Adam and Eve, our first parents did in the garden. Today, we are experiencing the effects of the fall. Those effects are death, 
degeneration, mutation accumulation, pain, suffering, extinction. That's what we see today. But prior to sin, death did not exist. Death did not exist prior to the fall. And so the Bible has incredibly important implications on the reality of our first parents. Scientific evidence confirms the reality and the existence of our first parents. And I just went over a couple lines of evidence, mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosome, genetic entropy, which we'll be talking about uh, in great detail. And I've never seen William Lane Craig address top creationist arguments. I haven't seen him address the Y chromosome data, the mitochondrial DNA data. I haven't seen him present any kind of natural selection that can rid populations of all of the deleterious mutations, these low impact, these nearly neutral mutations that are accumulating generation after generation, they're nearly neutral because selection can't see them. They're invisible to selection. And so they build up over time. They lead to genetic sickness. Selection can't remove them. They're the unselectables. They're subject to what? They're subject to genetic drift. And so they spread throughout the population. They degenerate. Take this point of most accumulating damage, of highest genetic load back to a point of no genetic load, where Adam and Eve would have no mutations. That would be a time of perfection. And that was just thousands of years ago. And we understand that through genetics. And so it's important because if we get rid of the historical Adam, we generate Theological difficulty after theological difficulty. And I'm here to tell you that there is absolutely no need to compromise the Bible. The Bible is true. God's word can be trusted. And so that's the biblical creation model. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay. Now, what he talks about here is overall agnostic to the creation versus evolution debate, the ancestry debate. So homology. He admits that, yes, hom homologous patterns, shared structures in the biological world and in genetics, whether you, you, know, you can look at the genomes of various organisms and find uh, shared patterns. You can find nested hierarchical patterns. Well, take your Microsoft programs, PowerPoint, Microsoft Word, and Excel. How many thousands of lines of code are shared between the three? Oh, many thousands. Okay, that doesn't mean that they all descend from Morse code thousands of years ago. No. So on an anatomical level, a morphological level, and a genetic level, we'd expect homologous patterns. See, here's the biblical creation model. God, um, the Bible says that we are created in the image of God. And therefore, that suggests that there must be something about us that reflects the divine because we're created in his image. And so we should be able to get a sense for how God created and how God designed based on the way we, who are created in his, his image, design. And it turns out that human engineers design in what? Homologous patterns. They design in nested hierarchical patterns, right? All sedans can be grouped together in a group called sedans. And sedans share more with each other than they would with an SUV. But if you bring in an SUV, into this hierarchy and compare sedans and higher and uh, vans, then sedans and vans are going to share more with each other than a boat or an airplane. Okay. Sedans, hatchbacks, SUVs, and vans all have more in common with each other than they do with a tractor trailer. And so modes of transportation fall within nested hierarchical patterns. Humans spend a lot of time uh, classifying things and organizing things. Humans organize tools. Humans organize books. You know, my bookshelf is typically, especially upstairs, organized with theology books here, science books here, you know, business books over here. And so we organize things. Classification is nice. Uh, the speaker, the one reading off Jason Lyle's article to William Lane Craig, talked about kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, right? Linnaeus classification. And so, yes, we can classify things. And it turns out that some creatures are more similar to each other than other creatures. Humans are more similar to chimpanzees than they are to dogs. Just stand back and look at the creatures. By definition, 
when God created, he created organisms that are going to have to look more similar to some creatures than other creatures. And it's pretty easy to figure out what's more similar to what. Again, your human and your chimpanzee look more similar in terms of anatomy and morphology than a human and a banana plant or a human and a fish. And yet, supposedly, we still share 50% of our DNA with banana plants. Okay, this universal DNA code that all life shares. And so homology is overall agnostic to the debate. Now, what I mean by that is if I were to say, you know what, creation's true. Humans are not related to chimpanzees because the sky is blue or the earth is round. You'd say, what in the world? Evolution can also explain why the sky is blue. That wouldn't be a good line of evidence for me to use against William Lane Craig because evolution can also explain that data. Many different models can explain why the sky is blue. And in the case of homologous patterns, the evolutionists would say that these shared structures in the biological world, they have been inherited from common ancestors, descent with modification, okay? And over time, these structures change a bit in terms of uh, morphology, mutations accumulate. Okay, th this is descent with modification. These structures modify over time. Um, and the creationist would say, well, God created in the beginning, Adam and Eve, and animals and orig in, in original created groups. And so these patterns observed are there for common design purposes. William Lane Craig asked, you know, what explains this? Well, common design, what's the reason why Toyotas, Hondas, Chevys, and Chryslers all share engines? It would be like William Lane Craig asking, well, why? What's the well, good design? Engines are good. Engines help the car run. Okay. And so it's a great thing. It's a great reality that all kinds of organisms share brains and hearts <laughs> because without brains and hearts, we wouldn't exist without engines, modes of transportation wouldn't exist. So this is good design. And it's funny because, and I'm going to go over some slides uh, in, in just a little bit, because I like to say it's the differences that make all the difference. Okay. So how do we answer this question of ancestry? Since Essentially, homology is overall agnostic. It's non-discriminate. There's a lot of overlap in the creation versus evolution world, right? Uh, both models can explain the data. So how do we discriminate between the models? How do we differentiate between the models? Well, the differences make all the differences. And I would love to see how William Lane Craig addresses the major differences that we find between humans and chimpanzees. And I'm going to go over a few of those in uh in in just a little bit and so here you, you know classification you can classify all, all all kinds of things and there's people who have a little too much time on their hands and what they'll do is classify things so we could if you draw a circle big enough you can fit anything in it so draw a circle and call it things that breathe now you can put just about anything gorillas babies horses bats how about things affected by gravity? Oh, you could throw Mars in there, bowling balls, humans, uh, chairs, motorized transportation. Okay, you got motorcycles, trucks, vans, boats, airplanes. And so if you draw a circle big enough, like the evolutionists do, you carry out. Boom, now you got whales, you got pine trees. It doesn't prove relationship. Humans classify uh, automobiles all the time. Go to any car lot, whether it's new or used, and you're going to have SUVs over here, you're going to have vans over here, you're going to have sedans over here, luxury vehicles over here, used cars here, new cars here, okay? Classifying things doesn't prove anything. Again, humans build in homologous patterns. Look at all these different kinds of vehicles. You can take vehicles from North America, from Europe, from South America, and they're all going to have many features in common many features in common. We even have hard to classify vehicles like your crossover SUVs. They resist class classification. You can get an SUV. Okay. Think of like a Ford Escape, or you can get a van. Think of a Chrysler Pacifica or Dodge Caravan, or you can get something right in the middle. You don't necessarily want an SUV and you don't necessarily want a van. So you decide to go with the Dodge Journey or the Ford Flex or the Jeep Gladiator. 
Well, these crossover vehicles are not necessarily a van or an SUV, but they're designed for functional purposes. Because somebody who buys an SUV or a crossover SUV, they're buying it for a reason. It works for them. Okay. And we find in the biological world all kinds of hard to classify creatures. Just right here, we've got Tiktaalik, right? Your famous fishapod. You've got the mammal like reptiles, uh, like your, your therapsids, synapsids. Uh, you've got Archaeopteryx. And so, again, we should be able to get a sense for how God designed based on the way we design things. And it turns out we build and design interesting mosaics or hard to classify vehicles. That goes for tools as well. You have tools that are very difficult to uh, classify. Humans build in uh, homologous patterns and also nested hierarchical patterns. So this is overall agnostic. The military, they've designed a, a vehicle that is not necessarily built for the ocean. It's not necessarily built for the land. It's built for the transitional environment between sea and land. And so your military amphibious assault vehicle, it wouldn't do well in the sea and it wouldn't do well just on the land, but it is perfect for that transitional environment between sea and land. And so again, this is good design. And so if we find some interesting mosaics in the fossil record or just in terms of extant creatures. It's not evidence for evolution because it fits perfectly with the biblical creation model. William Lane Craig is, is asking, what does he mean by biblical creation? It's a mystery. But if William Lane Craig were up to date on top creationist arguments and models, if he's read the literature from, let's say myself or Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, Dr. Rob Carter, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, uh, Dr. John Sanford, he'd be familiar with various creationist models, the strongest models, and he'd he'd counter those, but he's not countering them. Even in terms of similar genetic sequences, let's say between uh, humans and chimpanzees, there exists massive differences in the way those genes are expressed or the way those genes are, are regulated. There's differences in the 3D arrangement of the genomes. There's differences in epigenetics. So even in similar sequences, we find differences. Okay, gene expression. What is that? Well, that's the process basically by which a gene gets turned on in a cell to make RNA and proteins. Okay, your process of uh, transcription, translation, right? DNA, RNA to protein. DNA transcribed into RNA translated into protein. And so the way this is done in the cell, we find differences between humans and chimpanzees. How do you explain that? Differences in alternative splicing, all kinds of differences. The Y chromosome, we'll get, get, we'll get into that in a little bit. And so the evolutionists, they want to line things up, right? So you got a ship that's built for the sea. You got a tank that's built for the land. And right in the middle, you can just toss in the military amphibious assault vehicle. Lining things up isn't proving anything. Okay. The evolutionists often, oftentimes say, well, we predicted in this specific layer in the geological column, you know, we, we wanted to find this, you know, the fishapod, Tiktaalik, even though they found after the discovery of Tiktaalik, they found tetrapod foot tracks in Poland that predate Tiktaalik by like 40 million years, telling us that tetrapods existed prior to Tiktaalik. What does the biblical creation model expect? What do we predict? Overlap significant overlap, intermingling, coexistence in the fossil record. And that's what we find. Tetrapods coexisting with Tiktaalik, another agnostic line of evidence. When it comes to human evolution, we see coexistence, interbreeding, intermingling with all the homotypes, whether it's Naledi, whether it's Arachdus, Heidelbergensis, Neanderthalensis, Hobbit, right? Homo floresiensis. We see uh, coexistence and overlap with the Australopithecines, with Paranthropus. This is what we'd expect to find. And so sure, Today, we have a unicycle, we have a bicycle, and a four-wheeler. And so I say, you know what? I predict that we're going to find a tricycle out there. And lo and behold, we find a tricycle, and we toss it right in between the bicycle and the four-wheeler, and your unicycle basically evolved into the four-wheeler. No, this is imagination. Evolutionists hope, dream, and imagine that they're related to strawberries. This is not science. Okay? So again, humans share much in common. All humans are 99.99% the same. 
How does William Lane Craig expect the fact or explain the fact that humans have incredibly low genetic variation? That goes for your uniparentally inherited DNA compartments, autosomal DNA. Y chromosome is autosomal DNA, but this is uh, biparentally inherited DNA. It's all low genetic variation. What does Genesis say? We read it earlier. God created two people, Adam and Eve. Right off the bat, that restricts genetic diversity. And so what do we find today? Humans have low genetic diversity. That fits perfectly. But the evolutionary community, they had to retrofit the data because if evolution was true and we've been evolving for millions of years from pre-Australopithecine-like ancestors to the Australopithecines to Homo habilis to Homo erectus and eventually Homo sapiens, well, every single generation, mutations are accumulating. Evolution ex evolutionists explain the vast majority, if not all genetic variation as being the result of mutations over time. Mutations add something new because mutations are add, so adding something that was not previously there. And so what should we find today? We should find high levels of genetic diversity. Millions of years of evolutionary change, a lot of genes floating around these populations. And so we should find humans with high levels of genetic diversity, but we don't find that. We find humans with low levels of genetic diversity. And so evolutionists do what they do best, post hoc and ad hoc rationalize their way out of the problem and out of the challenge, but they're not actually answering the challenge. And so my challenge to William Lane Craig is how do you explain the genetic data that points us right back to a literal Adam and Eve, a historical Adam and Eve that's perfectly consistent with what the Bible describes as being our first parents. Because if you're going to look to this out of Africa near extinction event, whether it's 70,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago, that doesn't work because that would have been a near extinction event. Humans at that time would have been reduced to somewhere between two and 10,000 people on the planet. Okay, and this would have had to have uh, been the case. Humans would have had to existed in a small population for thousands of years. Let's just say a thousand years for many generations. Put it this way, it wasn't a one generation bottleneck. Well, what happens is these, this population in, in, begins inbreeding. Inbreeding reveals the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes. So these deleterious uh, recessive mutations come to the forefront. They um, lead to accelerated genetic degeneration. All kinds of diseases are manifested. And so this population would have been compromised genetically. And we're supposed to believe that through this near extinction event, this genetically compromised population of between two and 10,000 humans suddenly spreads out into all parts of the globe, seizing dominion over the planet. No, that's fairy tale. That's, that's empirical. They can believe such a thing, but it's a story. And it's a story that was concocted because the levels of genetic diversity in humans did not fit the evolutionary model. And so, no, it's not a surprise that humans and primates share a lot more in terms of morphology, genetics, physiology, and anatomy than let's say humans, primates, and insects do. A human is going to share more with a lemur, okay, which is categorized as a primate, than a human is going to share with, a, uh, let's say, a bee or a butterfly or a banana plant. Is it any surprise that humans here share more with a chimpanzee than they do with a lizard or a fish. This is just expected. Humans have to be more similar to one creature and less similar to another. Just like a sedan has to be similar to one mode of transportation more than another mode of transportation. Sedans are a lot more similar with hatchbacks than they are with boats or skateboards. Again, sedans can all be grouped together as sedans, you can bring in, you know, vehicles with four wheels, bring in SUVs, bring in vans. Sedans, SUVs, and vans are all going to share a lot more with each other than they do with other engine powered vehicles like airplanes. It's a natural nested hierarchy. Look at the fencing pliers. They're designed with a multi-purpose design that incorporates a staple puller, fencing wire cutter, fencing wire puller, all types of 
designs incorporated into one major design, the fencing pliers. And so that's a hard to classify tool. And so the point is, ladies and gentlemen, is homology, this first line of evidence that's being focused on, it is agnostic. It is completely agnostic to the overall question of ancestry. But when you actually dig deep into the question of homology, you find significant differences that the evolutionist can't explain. I'll just go over this briefly because I've done entire presentations on this one. You'll notice the human uh, Y chromosomes. I'd like to know how William Lane Craig explains the massive dissimilarity between human and chimpanzee Y chromosomes. I have debated this for about four years now. There's never been a good answer. The answer is that they do give the rescue devices faster rates of gene conversion, sperm competition, for example, massive gene loss. It's all stories. It's all untested, untested hypotheses. So notice you got humans, their Y chromosome is much different than the chimpanzee Y chromosome. Notice right off the bat, the size difference. When you <clears throat> consider overall gene content, overall size differences, overall architecture between human and chimpanzee Y chromosomes, it's only about 35 to 40% the same. Right off the bat, you're starting with 50%. It's half the size. Bring in the gorilla Y chromosome and guess what? There's a break in the nested hierarchy where you've got the human Y and the gorilla Y more similar to each other than either are to the chimpanzee Y. This makes sense from the biblical creation model, which is a giant mystery to William Lane Craig, apparently. Well, humans are their own created kind. They're not related to chimpanzees and gorillas. And a phylogeny that I've displayed earlier have gorillas as their own separate created kind. Going back to a common ancestor, chimpanzees and bonobos related, going back to a common arc archetype, and then humans as their own created kind. How do you explain, William Lang Craig, these massive differences? Because he's going to have to explain from the evolutionary model sometime after the split, okay, after humans and chimpanzees diverge from a common ancestor about six million years ago, give them nine or 10 million years, you're going to have to explain massive gene loss, chromosomal reorganizations, rearrangements. You're going to have to explain the evolution of entire new gene families. The gene content's totally different. Okay, notice this from a uh, detailed paper on the great ape Y chromosomes in 2020. Despite a recent divergence of these species, their Y chromosomes differ enormously in size and gene content. Guys, this wasn't predicted. The Chipman's EY is only half the size of the human Y, as I said. And the percentage of gene families shared by these two chromosomes that split about 6 million years ago is similar to that shared by human and chicken autosomes that split 310 million years ago. This is very puzzling to them. Notice what they say here. Puzzlingly or confusingly, in terms of shared genes and overall architecture, the human Y is more similar to the gorilla Y than to the chimpanzee Y. We have all kinds of breaks in the so-called nested hierarchy. Depending on if you're looking at, um, depending on what genes you're looking at, you get totally different families, right? There's something called incomplete lineage sorting. Uh, orphan genes, these taxonomically restricted genes that have no evidence for precursor genes no evidence for their evolution. Where'd they come from? They're basically just there. They popped into existence. While there is no consistency in uh, the hierarchy in the grade eight family when it comes to uh, orphan genes, convergent evolution. Anytime convergent evolution is invoked, the independent evolution basically or acquiring of, of traits in various organisms independently, okay? Um, as in they didn't inherit them from common ancestors. They evolved the same traits independently. Well, anytime that's invoked by the evolutionist, that is an admittance into the lack of uniqueness in the phylogenetic uh, tree. So there's all sorts of breaks in the so-called uh, nested hierarchy. So again, differences in gene expression. So the way that these genes are expressed in humans and uh, uh, great apes, chimpanzees, 
So notice this paper. Our results indicate that the human brain displays a distinctive pattern of gene expression relative to non-human primates with higher expression levels for many genes belonging to a wide variety of functional classes. So we have uniqueness in the way genes are expressed in humans. Notice this one. We identified species-specific gene expression patterns, indicating that changes in protein and gene expression have been particularly pronounced in the human gene. The HapMap project, the HapMap project has given us tremendous evidence for separate ancestry. Notice this, the human genome is young. Shared blocks of DNA are large and there has not been enough time to scramble them to randomness. Let me explain. And I want William Lane Craig to explain this, okay? Or some of uh, his fellow theistic evolutionists. Every generation we experience recombination. <clears throat> Our genetic variants recombine to uh, create new chromosomal combinations, okay? This is how we get genetic variation. And no, the creatius doesn't need millions of years to build up the necessary genetic variation through mutations for recombination to work effectively because creationists hold to a model called created nuclear heterozygosity or design diversity. And so if most DNA variation is there at the start. Most DNA variation is created and front-loaded, okay? Basically, organisms are designed with internal diversity. Then you don't need millions of years for mutations to accumulate because those DNA differences are already there from the beginning. And so one generation through recombination and gene conversion, you can get new varieties, you can get new chromosomal combinations quickly. Because again, those DNA variants or those design variants are built in from the start. And so if you have every generation recombination, you've got gene conversion, you got the scrambling of the genome. Why do we still have these massive shared blocks of DNA? Got these linkage blocks, some of them 10,000 nucleotides. <laughs> they have no evidence for ever being scrambled. But if we go back as humans, apparently 200,000 years into Africa, and before that to Erectus, and before that to Habilis and Australopithecine-like ancestors, then you know what? That many generations should have scrambled the genome into nothingness. But no, we see that there's not been enough time to scramble them to randomness. There's no evidence that there's been hundreds of thousands of years of genome scrambling through recombination and gene conversion. That tells us that the genome is young. There's only been about 4,500 years since the flood worth of recombination and gene conversion. But your theistic evolutionists of the world seem unaware of these data points. They don't seem up to date on the data. They're not engaging with our best scientific arguments and it's very disappointing. It's very disappointing because they misrepresent our position. They misrepresent our model. Notice this, the human population came from a single source. Most blocks are shared among all world populations. Even the allele frequencies, Okay, alleles being genetic variants, frequency being the uh, frequency they occur in certain populations and in the world. For example, your uh, blue-eyed mutation, it's, it occurs in a low frequency. Only a certain uh, set of the population have it. We can tell that that's due to a true mutation. That's not a created allele. Okay, but the way allele frequencies are or why chromosomes worldwide, we have evidence of the Tower of Babel dispersal. Because basically you have this dispersal event at the Tower of Babel and all your groups, once they're separated and isolated from each other, they start accumulating their own independent mutations. And we can actually look at people groups worldwide. We can examine their genetics and we can see uh, African specific Y chromosomes, European specific Y chromosomes, Chinese specific Y chromosomes, because these people groups after the spreading out at the Tower of Babel, they're accumulating their own separate mutations. And yet human genetics worldwide still remains uniform, homogeneous. That's amazing evidence for biblical creation. That's amazing evidence for the Tower of Babel dispersal. And we find the same thing with, with allele frequencies. Notice this, the human genome is falling apart. Deletions tend to not be shared among populations, but are unique to subpopulations. This is further evidence for the youth of the genome and that we came from a single source population. And so let me just see if I've touched on everything that I've wanted to hear. I really wanted to showcase 
why homology, when you just look at it at a surface level, it's agnostic. But when you dig deep, like we did here, the uh, differences make all the difference. And the evolutionists are incapable of explaining the differences. We've also got inadequate mechanisms for neo-Darwinian change. And guess what? Without an adequate mechanism, any of these historical reconstructions that we see advanced by the evolutionists in the evolutionary community, they lack any explanatory power. They're just reconstructions, their stories, their artwork, and that's cute. But we should not view it as a correct reconstruction because mutations are overwhelmingly deleterious and natural selection is just a selective process. It's a fine-tuning mechanism that keeps the species as strong as they can be. Genomes are going downhill. Deleterious mutations are accumulating. There's tremendous evidence for genome-wide functionality. And so universal common descent, which William Lane Craig believes in, is basically a presupposition imposed on the genetic data because the genetic data does not support any kind of large-scale or forward evolution. And so it's not a conclusion drawn from the genetic data because the conclusion drawn from the genetic data is that there are literal shelf lives on genomes because of low impact, nearly neutral, deleterious mutation accumulation. These are unselectable. And I want William Lane Craig, I challenge him to provide any kind of selection that can select away the unselectables. And I'll give you a hint. There is no kind of selection that can solve this problem of mutation accumulation. And so before I get too ahead of myself, we're going to wrap it up there because his next line of, of evidence goes into basically hierarchical patterns within what he calls non-functional regions of the genome. He also gets into uh, arguments from pseudogenes. And so I want to save all of that for the uh, next episode in this series. I am really going to comprehensively dismantle junk DNA and dismantle the argument from pseudogenes. And I am going to demonstrate exactly why it is a great time to be a biblical creationist. So everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Share this content around because the truth is important. God bless.